Hello, and welcome to our fifth Patient Ambassador Program webinar of 2002 with Chris Klug Foundation. Um, today, we're highlighting liver transplant, uh, liver transplants, the liver transplant process, aiming to help uh, candidates, patients, recipients uh, through this process uh, and help them uh, succeed and, and achieve a great quality of life. Uh, my name is Chris Klug. I'm the founder and chairman of Chris Klug Foundation. A, uh, let's see, we're, we're approaching 18 years now uh, as a 501c3 nonprofit organization with the mission of advocating for organ and tissue donation awareness and helping those touched by transplanta transplantation. Just like I was, uh, I'm a 22-year liver transplant recipient celebrating on July 28th in just a few weeks and uh, very grateful to still be here and, and very mindful of that gift that I've been given and forever humbled and, and grateful for that second chance. And that's what CKF is all about. Uh, I wanna say a few thank yous before uh, I get the honor of introducing uh, our panelists today. I uh, wanna recognize our, our sponsors and friends, Hertz for make the patient ambassador panel tour with Chris Klug Foundation uh, possible. I also want to say thanks to our executive director, uh, CC Cunningham, our program director, uh, Anna Morgan uh, Pallady for uh, all they do and, and pulling this off and, and uh, for putting up with me. Uh, anyway, excited to uh, for a great conversation today. Just want to mention if you're new to uh, Zoom, you'll notice we have uh, a Q&A box to field questions to the panelists on your console. Uh, we'll have a brief Q&A at the end, so I encourage all of you to type your questions into the Q&A box uh, as they come to mind. On that note, let's uh, jump into the intros. As I said, I get the honor to introduce our two transplant recipients and our transplant surgeon, uh, and then I've got some questions prepared to, to uh, pose to them, and then uh, you'll get a chance to ask some questions and uh, encourage the uh, panelists if you've got some uh, valuable insight, or you can add to a response from one of the fellow panelists, feel free to jump in and uh, let's have the best uh, conversation that we can. I first get to introduce uh, Alex Kula. Alex is an MD, MHS, uh, is currently a pediatric nephrologist at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and Northwestern University. At the age of 19, he received a life-saving split liver transplant from his uncle, Jim Kula. Uh, four years earlier, he had been diagnosed with ulcerative colitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, Alex, I know a thing or two about that. In many ways, his transplant was more than just the recipient of a healthy liver. It was also the gift of a new opportunity. After his transplant, he attended medical school at Yale University. Though in medical school, he realized his purpose was to help young patients overcome their illness and gain the opportunity to live a life not defined by their condition. Next, he did a pediatric residency at Seattle Children's Hospital and stayed on as the nephrology fellow. He remains actively researching how young people with organ failure and transplants progress from children to adults. The main goal is to ensure that all young people can live long, meaningful lives. That's what we're all about, Alex. Thanks a lot for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Deepak uh, Vikraman. Dr. Deepak Vikraman is a transplant surgeon. He specializes in highly complex surgeries to replace dysfunctional organs. Dr. Deepak Vikraman graduated from Trivandrum Medical College. I might be getting that wrong there, excuse me, uh, with my pronunciation. In 1998, before completing a residency in general surgery at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. He then completed a fellowship in transplant surgery at Duke University Medical Center from 2007 to 2009. He has been in practice for more than 20 years. Dr. Vikraman is currently a liver transplant surgeon at Duke Transplant Center. Doc, thanks a lot for joining us. Excited to have you uh, with us today. Thanks for being a part of this. Oh, no, thanks for inviting me. Our uh, final panelist is Phil Shin. Phil is a husband, father, and runner from Southern California. And in 2018, he was diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma. Hopefully I'm saying that right, Doc. A, a rare liver cancer. Phil has been free from cancer since September 2019 when he underwent successful liver transplant surgery. He has run the Boston Marathon multiple times and is always raising awareness for organ donation, 
when doing so. In 2019, Phil teamed up with the Los Angeles Marathon and Conquer Endurance Group to share his journey through a two-part documentary. Phil has never stopped running, and in that way, he's never stopped living. He hopes that while we are alive, with cancer or not, we can continue to live. Our, uh, our mantra at CKF, Phil, is live life, give life, and I know you embody that. So thanks for all you do for the Transmat community and for being a part of this conversation today. Hey, thanks, Chris. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah, likewise. I'm, uh, as I said uh, in my intro, almost 22 years after my liver transplant, I'm stoked to be here too. And uh, really has been an incredible gift as, um, uh, as we know as, as transplant recipients, both Alex and, and Phil and myself, as scary as it was. And that uh, at times we thought we were standing on death's doorstep. It is uh, an incredible gift to be given and, uh, and to have a new lease on life gives you an amazing perspective. I know that sounds cliche, but uh, that's really what uh, motivated me to start Chris Klug Foundation and, and volunteer to this day, almost 18 years later. Uh, just want to touch real quickly on what CKF is all about. As I said, we're, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around for almost 18 years. Uh, some of our main events are we do a National Donor Day event on Valentine's Day where uh, we reach out to all of our partners and friends and encourage everybody on, on the largest single day donor drive to uh, share their decision with others, to um, document that donor decision. We do, of course, this ambassador panel tour, which is a big part of our programming. We do campus donor dudes events, uh, campus donor dudes game night events on uh, junior high and high school campuses around the country. Uh, big push, of course, for all of us in, uh, in April for Donate Life Month. We do a, uh, the largest uh, nighttime uphill ski mountaineering and snowshoe race uh, in the country, Summit for Life, December 3rd uh, of this year. Uh, so lots of stuff and, and always looking at, at ways to improve and, and have fun. Uh, I would say, you know, let's, uh, let's have fun sharing this life-saving message. So that's what CKF is all about, to give you a little more background. Let's jump into it. Alex, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, again, if, if uh, Phil or uh, Doc, if you guys have something to add to a question that's directed to somebody else, feel free to jump in. We want to have an engaging uh, back and forth here. And if you have something to add interrupt me and uh, feel free to chime in. So Alex, let's go for it. When you were first told you needed a liver transplant, what was your reaction? Did you fully understand your diagnosis? How'd you come to terms with the idea of a liver transplant? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it was a bit of a shock. And I think in some ways being younger was very helpful in that maybe I was a little bit more naive and optimistic um, where it seemed like you know, this, this is a big deal. This is going to affect my life in a big way. Um, but, but for me, I kind of felt that the ultimate goal was still past that of the things I wanted to accomplish and, um, you know, the experiences I wanted to have in my life. So I kind of felt like this was the, the step I needed to take. And this would, would be the, the life-saving option that would, you know, give me those possibilities. And so, you know, when I was kind of through processing the shock, it became a little bit more ominous, but, you know, I think I'm also have benefited from the very positive transplant culture. And I think in medicine, in patient advocacy groups, those who are involved in the transplant process are naturally very optimistic, very determined individuals. And, it, and I think that in a way provides a lot of support and is something that I hope to continue on now as a physician myself. Good for you, Alex. You've been a big supporter of CKF and of, of helping the transplant community as a recipient uh, and in your current role and, and really grateful for the work you do. I'll just add that when I, uh, when I was diagnosed, I remember looking around the room thinking, you know, who are they talking to? They can't be talking to me. I feel mm -hmm. like a million bucks. You got the wrong guy, doc. You're nuts. And then I came to terms with that was the diagnosis. And I thought mm -hmm. it was a death sentence. I thought, well, people don't survive liver transplants. And I thought, well, okay, maybe they survive transplants, but their quality of life sucks, pardon my French. Mm -hmm. That was my thinking. And then I, I came to learn that you could bounce back from this and, and live a great quality of life. And 
that was sort of how I entered this and, and almost said, I'm going to train in effect for this race for my life. I'm going to do everything I can to give myself the best possible chance to uh, bounce back to a great quality of life. And today I can stand here and say almost 22 years later, there's nothing I can't do. Um, maybe a few things because I'm turning 50 this year, but uh, nothing related to a liver transplant that I can't do today. And I'm way healthier post-transplant than I ever was before. And I love sharing that message, Alex, in, in everything that I do, because I know there's a lot of people just like uh, you and Phil and I that are diagnosed with a transplant and it's shock and awe. And then it's, well, my, my quality of life is going to stink. And, uh, you know, you and I and, and Phil are here to say, well, that doesn't have to be the case. It's still very, and I remember actually going, your story was very inspiring to me going through the transplant process. And, you know, I mean, 2007 wasn't that long ago, but there wasn't the kind of widespread connection that we all have, you know, in virtual communities. And I didn't know anyone else who was young. And when I was at the hospital, it was me and a bunch of people much older than me. And so it was there were a lot of fears of what does it mean for a younger person? And, you know, seeing that someone could really thrive was something that gave me a lot of hope. For sure. Well, you're giving a lot of people hope as well. Dr. Vickerman, what advice would you give to a transplant candidate and their family as they await their transplant? Um, I hope you all can hear me. Um, Perfectly. I think, uh, yeah. Okay. So the, I think the first um, thing that, um, any transplant recipient ought to uh, understand is to, you know, they, they actually have to find the, the, the best transplant center that's out there. The, the nearest one may not be the best center that uh, they may have the best outcome. So, you know, doing some research on your own uh, is actually a good start to figure out what are the options that I have and what are the, what is the best transplant center that I need to go to? So when, when I say that, um, what are the things that you're looking for? So the things that you need to look for is the, what is their survival? What's the patient survival rate of that particular uh, transplant center? What's the graph survival for that particular transplant center? And then the other thing is, how are they getting these patients transplanted? So there is all these things that are publicly available for uh, people to uh, look at. Um, so the transplant rate is also very important because, you know, the rate at which a patient gets transplanted in that given institution is actually a good marker because, you know, you don't want to get listed for liver transplant at a particular hospital and sit on the waiting list uh, for a prolonged period of time. So it is very important that you do your research. And then the second thing is, once you find that um, hospital and, and, and the personnel who's going to take you through that journey, I think there's some homework that you also ought to do because, you know, as Chris said, you know, you had hepatocellular carcinoma, and so you were pretty well preserved, as you said. It came as a surprise for you when, when you were told that, uh, you know, you needed liver transplant. But many of the unfortunate patients who need liver transplant have the, you know, the raging side effects of all the, uh, of the liver disease, which makes them have anxieties and they are confused and they start losing their muscle mass and everything. So, you know, try to stay as active as possible. Try to get the best nutrition um, possible try to get on a waiting list and, you know, and stay in close touch with your transplant center because the minute you start getting sick, uh, you don't want to go to another center and get stuck in a place where they don't have any expertise in taking care of a sick liver transplant patient. You need to be in a transplant center. Good advice. Thanks, Doc. Phil, what did the transplant process look like for you? How did uh, your life change during the time between receiving your diagnosis until you received your transplant? Um, yeah, it actually paralleled a lot of the same experiences that both you and Alex had. Um, I also received my diagnosis when I was very healthy. In fact, I was just coming off running the 2018 LA Marathon, and I was... Uh, <laughs> making aspirations to finally qualify for that Boston Marathon. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I definitely experienced, as Alex said, that initial shock, right? And I, you know, I walked into the, uh, the liver clinic and, you know, I looked around in the waiting room and, you know, these are people who are just direly sick. I mean, they were fully jaundiced, they had the yellow eyes. And it still strikes me quite uh, vividly that one image I had of this woman just 
sitting in a wheelchair on oxygen and she just had those two big Ziploc bags just filled with meds. And I was walking in and, you know, in my uh, running sweats, my running shoes and, and a hoodie. And I, what am I doing here? This just doesn't make any sense to me. Why am I here? Well, it turns out I had liver cancer, right? And um, I was, because I was in such good health as a, as a runner, I was never symptomatic uh, like you, Chris. I just came across my diagnosis through a regular blood test. I knew that my family had a history of hepatitis. So I shared that with my physician and Dr. Vikram and what you said in terms of research. I, I think there's another thing of just about, you know, being a, a really strong self-advocate, right? So I, even though I felt healthy, I felt compelled to just let my physician know but hey, I have this history in my family of hepatitis, um, but I feel fine. Uh, but my physician, he says, well, I don't know you. Why don't we just go ahead and do the full panel of liver blood tests? And that's when they discovered that there was a racquetball-sized tumor in my liver, despite the fact that I was still running and running strong, and I just had aspirations to run even stronger. So I had to put everything on pause and just deal with this confusion that was just washing over me and my family that, hey, we have liver cancer, uh, we got to do something about this. So from being initially diagnosed to having that first surgery, which was uh, a liver resection to just remove that segment of the uh, liver that um, that that uh, tumor was sitting in. It actually took that surgery for me to realize that, oh, wow, I have cancer, I had this 15 inch scar on my abdomen, I woke up from the surgery, I said, wow, guess what? We have cancer. This is what we're dealing with. So that's how fast everything happened. So we never really kind of escaped that sense of confusion. So, um, and from there, we, you know, we, we recovered it from it nicely. And, uh, it, and again, Dr. Brickman, I can't uh, support your recommendation strong enough about just being physically active and, you know, continue to you know, advocate for your own health by staying healthy, eating right. Because of you know I, having that foundational help, I was able to recover from that surgery very quickly. Um, so quickly that I actually ended up running a marathon six months after that resection, and I finally qualified for the Boston Marathon. <laughs> so that was a huge win, huge celebratory moment for me and my family. But then I had because I was on the cancer protocol, I had, you know, I, I was going through the monthly blood test, the quarterly scans. And right before that Boston qualifying marathon, I, I had gone in for another scan, ran that marathon, qualified for Boston, came in for a follow up appointment with my um, hepatologist. And I came in with my medal saying, hey, look what I just qualified for the Boston marathon. <laughs> He says, well, that's great, but we need you to sit down because um, it looks like your cancer's come back. So, and now your only option is a liver transplant. So to deal with that first blow of having that initial cancer diagnosis, then having that resection to recovering and then running that marathon, qualifying for Boston to get dealt with that gut punch of you know, having that cancer come back and now dealing with the fact that your only curative option now is a transplant. It was just completely mind blowing. So yeah, so the, to say that my journey has been a bit of a whirlwind is probably a little bit of an understatement, but it's definitely been a whirlwind, but you know, one filled with gratitude because I was eventually able to get that transplant and then continue running and running better than I've run before. That's unbelievable, Phil. What a, uh, as you said, what a roller coaster of emotions. And man, I, uh, I could just see you coming into the, the hospital and, and showing your medals. So excited to share the good news of qualifying for Boston. And the doc must have been, you know, not exactly sure what to do, but sit down. I've got some more bad news to, to share effectively. What a uh, tough conversation, but really admire how you navigated through that and, uh, and, and figured it out. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, That's you know, awesome. it, and I, I think it just kind of goes back to what Alex was saying with regards to just that positive community that we have in this. I think, I think that's foundational for the transplant community. You have to be positive, right? Because there's so much uncertainty. There's so much unknowns. Um, you need to 
build this village around you of positivity to just kind of help you get to that next day because you get through the next day you get through the next day you get to the next day that transplant's eventually going to come to you right that that's the hope that we hold on to and you know that it's a shared language that we have and i'm so honored to be able to share this language with you know our transplant community it definitely helps having a great support network too i had a lot of help uh, as I was on the waiting list and preparing for my transplant and uh, couldn't have got through it without friends and family and uh, even some strangers that uh, became friends uh, along the way and, and people that were going through the process together with me. And uh, as I said earlier, as scary as it was, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. It really was uh, a miracle and um, a, a very positive experience. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Alex, let me ask you, after your transplant, you followed a career in medicine, becoming a pediatric nephrologist. Uh, what inspired you to take this path? Yeah, I think, you know, in, in, some, in some ways, one of the, the real positive takeaways from this whole transplant experience was discovering a love of medicine. And so before this all happened, I knew I liked science. I was kind of a nerdy guy. I knew I wanted to do something related to that, but I didn't really have a good sense of direction. And going through the transplant kind of forcibly pointed me in the, the right direction. And it and it just happened to be this wonderful coincidence that the, that the topic and the subject matter was something that was just so interesting to me. And I connected with and seemed to to really be something I wanted to explore more. And so it was, it really kind of set me on this path towards, my, and especially going through the experience of a patient and a younger patient, I think was very important. And starting medical school, I was still trying to figure out, there's a lot of specialties, there's a lot of different types of physicians you can be. But I think the one um, driving force was that I wanted to help other young people who are kind of creating their identity and who are planning for a life and going through major health obstacles, really be someone who can help shepherd them through that process. And so that's kind of since guided me to where I am now. And um, it's been very rewarding. It's something I really enjoy doing. It's, it's, a, it's a job I look forward to coming to work every day, sometimes a little bit earlier than I'd like, but it's, um, it's, and so it's, it's just this kind of in a way, a happy coincidence that that this all happened and set me on this journey. And um, yeah, I try to pay it back every day when I'm working with my patients. But you're a, a split liver, liver transplant recipient and went into the kidney business. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, well, I was <laughs> trying to, I thought I was going to be a hepatologist and, and work with young people who had liver transplants. And then and then it happened to be when I did my elective during residency on liver, I also had my yearly transplant kind of evaluation at the hospital. And then at the end of it, I was like, I'm just too tired of thinking about livers all day. And so it was, uh, um, I, I, knew, I think the kidney was something I always, it, they're kind of like partners. When it, a lot of times the kidney gets wrapped up in the liver and all these organs kind of get wrapped up in their problems, but there's similar experiences where when individuals have kidney failure and need a kidney transplant, or going through dialysis, that kind of reality of living with chronic disease. And so that that's really what I was most attracted to. And, um, and it's another realm where I think there's lots of possibilities for young people who get transplants. And, um, and so it's really kind of fulfilling in that way. Good for you. I love it. And it's, uh, it's all about, that's what our Bounce Back Give Back Award is all about, is someone that has a successful transplant gets a second chance at life or or enhances their quality of life, but then uses that opportunity, just like both of you I know are doing, to give back to their transplant community, to give back to their communities in general, and uh, and help make life better for those around us and, and those that are going through the same thing the three of us did. Phil, I want to uh, go back to your uh, post-transplant. Uh, you found, refound, I should say, or, or maybe never lost, but refocused uh, your passion for marathon running. Why do you feel it's important to keep an active lifestyle post-transplant? Uh, and how can others get involved uh, in activities post-transplant? Yeah, well, I, I certainly wouldn't recommend 
um, you to run a marathon six months post transplant. <laughs> I don't even think my own doctors really recommended it. Like, <laughs> I actually didn't even tell them because I, I remember you, Chris, even like uh, having a conversation one time about, you know, your surgeon not being able to really provide any guidance on what to do, you know, in terms of like trying to get back to training for the Olympics. Right. And, you know, certainly I'm not training for the marathon Olympics, but certainly I was like, you know, running 26.2 miles, that's a pretty big task, you know, with or without, you know, <laughs> a liver transplant. So um, I, my recommendation is definitely uh, do something to just kind of like give yourself uh, the opportunity to move forward, right? And I mean, both figuratively and literally, right? So um, the gift of life um, after a transplant, it's certainly a gift, but it it's a difficult gift to, to manage through, uh, because obviously you're, you're dealing with the recovery of a major abdominal surgery. And then you're also having to navigate through all the medication that you're on, which I'm still navigating through to this day, three years post-transplant. So the idea is to just find those incremental improvements. And because I had that foundation, uh, um, uh, of running, uh, I, I kind of knew what that language was in terms of, okay, we don't have to go out and run a half marathon today, you know, six weeks post transplant, but Hey, how about if I just try and do a lap around my block in my neighborhood, just walking it. Right. And then get up and do it again. And, you know, there's, there's something that I've, the two words that I've always just kind of like clung to since my cancer diagnosis was just to keep going. Right. If it's not a great day, that's fine, but keep going, show up tomorrow, you might be a better day, right? So um, if you just instill those reminders to yourself to just keep going, those improvements will happen. And you know, you have to look at every little thing as a win, right? So whether it's getting out of bed, whether it's being able to just, you know, go up and make your own breakfast, you know, tag those as wins, right? And before you know it, you're going to be able to step outside and go for a nice walk to the park or, you know, maybe even run a marathon. So, um, and obviously, you know, the, the physical benefits are fantastic because the more movement you have, right, the more circulation that creates and that'll just uh, accelerate your uh, recovery. But I think mentally also, you're, you're, you're certainly going to reap massive benefits by knowing that you can still do hard things. And, you know, hard, it's a very you know, relative term in terms of what a hard thing is. Me, a hard thing is trying to build up to an ultra marathon, right? But for others, it, it really is just getting up and just going for a walk down the street. So um, embrace those as wins, right? Not as obstacles or things that you weren't able to do before. So that certainly helped me in terms of my mental and emotional health and certainly my physical health. Bill, two things that you said that were poignant for me that really resonated were number one, celebrating your successes, your, your victories, your milestones. I think that's critical in business, in life, in, in uh, certainly transplant uh, and recovery from any major medical obstacle adversity. So I, I really appreciate that you brought that up. And, and I think the other one is just, you know, the benefits of, uh, of, of activity post-transplant and, and living a healthy, active, balanced lifestyle. And uh, for me, I know that that played a big role, not only going into my transplant, being as healthy as I could, but, but also really being cognizant of listening to my body because, you know, we can all do too much. And there's that fine line when you're preparing for the transplant surgery, for when we're on the waiting list and, and our health is deteriorating. And you always got to really listen to your body and, and do enough to this. So it's healthy, but not too much. So it, it takes away from uh, trying to prepare yourself and give yourself the best possible chance for a great outcome. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's also important to note for anybody who's watching this that's currently listed, right? It's, it, it is massively important to remain active because when, especially after I got that reappearance diagnosis, Chris, I could have easily just dug myself into a hole and just stayed in that hole because it, like you said, I think it was your words. It was, it can easily be viewed as a death sentence, right? So, because all that control that you have in terms of what you can do to reach a 
cure or a solution, it's taken away from you because you're dependent on someone to donate their liver to you, whether it's a living, mine happen to be a living donor, but, or a deceased donor, right? And it's just seeped in unknowns, right? So the best thing that I could do both mentally and physically was just to keep running. I was blessed to still have my health and have the ability to keep running. So I just took all the frustrations I had about, you know, have not having that control, you know, the unknowns and just taking it all out on running. And I think I probably ran more miles in those six months I was waiting for that transplant than I had in my entire life. I ended up running four marathons in those six months and I qualified for Boston two more times. So I really just kind of beat the crap out of running and my body, I guess, in the, in the process, because I figured, well, there's nothing worse than going through what I'm going through, you know, waiting for a transplant. So let's just see if I can dial this up to 11 and really, you know, take it out on, you know, the pavement. So, and it worked out, right? Good for you. I, uh, I have great respect for your marathon running. I uh, ran a, I'm not a great runner, but I ran the 2015 New York City Marathon with Chris Gloop Foundation. And we have a team every single year that runs it. And uh, I absolutely loved it. One of the coolest sporting events I've ever done, but you've never seen such a spectacular meltdown as uh, around <laughs> mile 22 or 23, the wheels fell off. So great respect for what you do. I'm not sure that's... Uh, a sport for Clydesdales at 215 miles, <laughs> but I, I really loved it. Love the energy, and and I absolutely can relate to the runner's high. I uh, I just got some work to do. Yeah, well, I I, I certainly admire. I, I don't know how many consecutive years you've done the uh, Leadville uh, Mountain Bike 100, but I, I want to say it's at least 12, 13 years. Is that in that right? Yeah, this year will be uh, my 12th. Fantastic. Yeah. So, I I. I really gravitated towards the trails uh, over the past two years, and um, I understand that you're probably one of the first liver transplant recipients to, you know, do the Leadville Trail mountain bike. Um, I was thinking maybe how cool it'd be if maybe next year I could be the first liver transplant recipient to run the Leadville 100 Trail Marathon, you know, Trail Ultra. So we'd love to have you. We'll uh, and we'll support you. All it's right, such a I'll cool be event as you come down Hope Pass. And through Twin Lakes, and my family and I, and uh, Cece and Anna have been there. Um, actually, this will be this will be Anna's first one, but Cece's been there the last four years. And I'll tell you, it brings uh, tears to my eyes when I see friends and uh, people that I know running through there. And, and not to mention at the finish line, it's uh, very emotional and, and an incredible accomplishment. Right. So yeah, I I've been doing research for the past few months, and I don't see any record of any transplant recipient whether it's kidney or liver to have run a hundred mile or so I'll just go ahead and say, I'll be the first one until somebody else can <laughs> prove me wrong. So I, and I'd love to We'd do love it. For, to have you, Phil. I'd love to do it for a CKF. So yeah, let's, 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 let's put that on the calendar. We'll save you a spot. Fantastic. Dr. Uh, Vikraman, I want to come back to you um, talking about uh, health and fitness and activity on the heels of what uh, Phil shared with us. How can a liver transplant recipient improve their chances of success after their surgery? Uh, do you feel it's important for transplant recipients to remain active post-transplant? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you are um, essentially starting a new life once you, once you get that uh, uh, organ transplantation because, um, you know, you are switching out, I should say, the organ and you are getting rid of a disease process and then you are acquiring a new chronic medical condition, which is immunosuppression, uh, which you, you know, most of you know that, I mean, three, three of you know that, uh, you know, you just have to be on for the rest of your lives. And uh, some of them, you know, manage to come to very minimal levels, but it is very hard to predict what each and every person uh, is uh, requires uh, to uh, keep their organ from projecting. So again, I think the first things first, uh, you know, if you're fit going into a transplant, your recovery is going to be much easier. So there is no doubt about it. The, the, the fitter you come, the well-nourished you are, the better you will go through the uh, transplant process because it's, a, you know, especially a liver transplant, it's a rather surgically challenging and it's very taxing on the patient's body. So you, you have to be fit for it. But, you know, again, then there are patients who can't get to that state and then we will, we will have to pull them through it. But then after the transplant is completed, again, compliance and, you know, uh, adhering to medical recommendations. 
Now, even, um, I mean, I've been doing it for almost close to 20 years, uh, you know, including my training. And even now, um, the, the, the amount of immunosuppression that you need or how to manage these immunosuppression medications, it sometimes baffles me. And, you know, and it is unfortunate that, you know, I, I also have a, uh, a keen interest in pediatric liver transplantation and pediatric kidney transplantation. And, you know, we transplant uh, many of these young ones as they are little ones. And then, you know, one of the major reasons for people to lose their uh, grafts, either the liver or the kidney, post-transplant in that age group or when the kids are transplanted is when they get to their teenage years and when they become independent and when they become non-compliant, not taking their medications, not showing up. So, you know, you are committed to a life with immunosuppression and you are also committed to, you know, you, these medications have a lot of side effects. And so you have to adhere to a very strict follow-up plan that is uh, recommended and uh, mandated by your transplant center. You need to identify who that center is. Most times, you know, once you get transplanted in a particular center, that center will just take care of you for the rest of the life, the organ and for the right life of you for that matter. So I think the key thing is adherence and, uh, and make sure that there is good follow-up. And, you know, I can't emphasize the importance of fitness um, either before transplant, post-transplant, or even if you don't need a transplant, just, you know, just as a common person, it is extremely important. And, you know, many of the disease processes that we see, which are preventable, like obesity, which is the mainstay problem in, in the U.S. right now, which is uh, coming to become the most leading cause for requiring a liver transplant because it's a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In the past, people used to drink themselves to get to the point of them needing a liver or, uh, or getting hepatitis C. Those are the two common reasons for um, liver transplantation in the past. Now, it is not because you know, alcohol still is, but uh, hepatitis C has a treatment and so that is going away. And the second thing is uh, you know, fatty liver disease. And so you know, that brings on diabetes, that brings on uh, hypertension, that brings on heart disease, and that also kills your liver. And so if you are extremely you know, if you're not fit and if you get to the point that your liver also needs to be replaced and if you also have diabetes and high blood pressure and also heart disease, your chances of even getting a liver transplant and, you know, going through with it without having major issues are pretty, pretty on the lower side. So, yeah, I mean, and, and again, you know, being active regardless of what you are, whether you need a transplant, whether you are post or pre it's extremely important. I can't stress the importance of it. And I always tell my patients, whoever who is coming to me, it's like a boxing match between me and my patient because I'm going to knock you out because I'm going to cut you open. I'm going to just cut through your muscles, you know, take your organ out, put a new one in. And if you are in fit enough, you, you know, you're going to have some struggle getting up, right? I mean, I mean it's, it's the same thing. So if the better shape that you're in, the better shape uh, you will come out of it. I mean, you know, there are, you know, and, and you know, all the three of you, you know, two, two of you went into the, uh, into the transplant with a good physical condition. Uh, two of you got uh, living donor transplant. And now that, that is not the usual um, uh, case that I see. You know, most patients who come to liver transplant, uh, they are ravaged by the liver disease. They are, and they're, you know, they're hanging by a thread. They have, you know, they're jaundice, they're, you know, the fluid status is off, their kidneys might be starting to fail, their muscle mass is off, and, and, and they don't have living donor options. And that, that is, you know, and that is why, you know, the, the need to get those patients taken care of in a center that has the expertise to use, you know, living donor transplants, uh, split liver, meaning, you know, to, taking a liver and cutting it into two pieces and putting in two different people, um, and also, you know, using various like, cutting edge uh, techniques and getting the patients transplanted at a much faster rate, it, it comes into play. Thanks, Doc. Love your energy and the advice. Appreciate you sharing it. What I'd like to do now, we've got a few questions from, uh, from our chat, from the Q&A. If uh, anybody else has questions and hasn't submitted them yet, now is the time. Um, Anna, would you like to uh, pose the questions to um, our, our panelists, or, or I'm happy to keep going. And then what I'd like to do is, um, once we get some of our questions from the chat in the Q&A box, what I'd like to do then is um, bounce back to you guys uh, for our three panelists for a few final comments. You've been putting up with this uh, snowboarder here trying to uh, MC this event. So 
Uh, if I miss something, I'll give you guys a final chance to uh, chime in. Anna, you want to ask uh, those questions, or I can go ahead and do it. I'll uh, I'll start with the question to Alex. Alex, what challenges uh, do you feel? This is from again from our Q and A. Uh, what challenges, Alex, do you feel young people specifically face as transplant recipients? How do you feel families can support them? Yeah, I don't think there's ever a good time to get a transplant, but I think getting it as a young person is especially difficult. And especially when you think about adolescents or young adults, it's it, that's a tough time in life for a lot of people, regardless of their underlying health issues. And, and I it's also a very informative time where you're creating this sense of identity and who I am and what my life is going to look like. And it's it, it can be challenging when going through something as major as a transplant, not to let your identity become um, your illness, where, where that's kind of now the focus. Of course, that's gonna be something you're focusing on for the rest of your life, but but everyone is so much more than just, than just their liver disease or their kidney disease. And rather, getting a transplant is a tool to help your life. And so, um, and so I, that's one of the challenges. Yeah, you're, uh, you're cutting in and out for some reason. Let me, uh, let me move on to Phil just for a second and then I'll come back to you, save that thought. I was wondering if I could just kind of like chime in with what Alex was saying. And uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I definitely think that having the uh, support of your family and your, your caregivers, it's critical. Uh, as you're going through transplant. Um, but what really helped me personally was just finding the transplant community, seeking the transplant community, because this is an experience that nobody knows unless you're going through it, right? So nobody in my family had experienced transplant. And, you know, I, I, I embraced the love that they were showering me with, but in terms of what I was going through mentally and emotionally, they just really couldn't fathom it. Um, so what I had to do was I had to seek communities like the Chris Kluge Foundation, the American Liver Foundation, even at my transplant clinic at Keck USC, we had a small transplant support group and there's shared language that only we can share. Nobody else can really share this. So to really be able to have those conversations as we navigate through this black hole that is transplant um no one it, it can it can be very very isolating so uh i would definitely recommend to anybody who is going through transplant or knows someone who is going through transplant to reach out to find those communities because we this is a very very supportive uh community we we embrace everybody uh, and again i just keep coming back to language this is the language that nobody else really understands even dr vickerman who hasn't I, as far as I understand, you, he hasn't gone through a transplant himself. There are certain elements to the mental and psychological um, challenges that we face as transplantees or, you know, um, people waiting for a transplant he, that even he wouldn't really be able to guide us in. So that would be my message, certainly. That's a perfect segue to another question we got in the chat is, uh, and Phil, I'll start with you. And, and I'd love to hear from Dr. Vickerman as well as from Alex, but how do you cope with the mental strains of the transplant process? Um, I think it's different for everybody, Chris. Um, uh, mine, it, it, it involved a lot of running, but again, it's not like I can run for 24 hours because I was still, because I was still healthy. I was still able to go to work, right? I was still able to, you know, support my family, be with my family. Uh, I have a teenage son. So I was able to do those things, but you know, for, for me, I, I still wasn't, I wasn't able to be, I wasn't able to be fully present uh, because you just had the unknown of, you know, transplant and it, mine was kind of twofold. It's not like I had, you know, just liver disease and, you know, a failing liver. I had cancer and because the liver is a vascular organ, very high risk of it spreading elsewhere. So I had just the risk of cancer, you know, spreading throughout my body. So there was a very, very high sense of urgency to get a transplant. 
but you know, I, I, I wanted her to be there for my family and, you know, do all the dad things and all the husband things, but you know, it, it was challenging and you, you need to, I think the best way for me to deal with those mental strains, Chris, is one, obviously the physical activity, but two, is just finding that community that we can share this experience with and have those conversations to kind of like coach us, coach us through because, you know, if I just find, you know, if I just were to speak to a coworker and, you know, they were to just tell me, oh, you're going to be fine. You're going to get through this. Well, I would call BS on it because you have no idea what I'm going through. Right. So you need to, you need to find those villages and, you know, uh, build those villages for yourself. And, you know, I, I've, I, I'm here fully to be, you know, to help you find that village and just as, you know, you are Chris. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Dr. Uh, Vikram, any suggestions from you on how uh, on how a patient navigates through the the stress and the and the emotional toil of the yeah. uh, process? Not just the as we talked about earlier, the shock of of learning that you need a transplant, but also you know all of the uh, hurdles that you've got to overcome uh, for a successful outcome. And even then, you know, uh, Phil, you touched on this earlier the responsibility that comes with this gift, with this second chance, taking anti-rejection drugs. I still take uh, anti-rejection drugs 22 years out. Uh, ironically, they just got lowered after uh, 20 plus years, but uh, getting a colonoscopy every few years, getting my skin cancer checkup, you know, eating and, uh, and watching, eating healthy, getting my labs. How do you deal, Doc, with the, the emotional uh, ups and downs of the whole transplant process pre- during, if you will, and post. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, okay. As Phil said, I think uh, connecting with uh, support groups is extremely important because, you know, again, uh, as a, as a pro physician who has never gone through on, one of these things, I, I, I honestly don't know what goes through your mind because I can, I can help you with the, with, the, with, the, with the surgery. I can get you through it. I can take care of any, any complications that happen after the fact. But you know, when it comes to uh, when when it comes to the matters of the mind, you actually need to. I mean, you know, as a part of the transplant evaluation, you you will actually get evaluated by multiple disciplines, and the disciplines that uh, you know usually people get um, uh, routinely uh, put through are one is a social worker. You will be assigned to a social worker who you, um, who uh, essentially can provide you with some resources that are available and uh, whatnot. And then you also have a very thorough uh, um, medical psychology examination where, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very trained uh, psychologist who uh, kind of knows the, uh, what patients go through. And they are also good at identifying the uh, risk factors of, you know, for example, anxiety, depression, and uh, how that person is going to cope with this whole thing. And they will actually make recommendations as to what you uh, what you could do while, while you're waiting for uh, for the transplant because you know again this is that is not you know something that I, you know i'm not an expert in anything i can only, only you know put things back in but or take it out but uh, you know when it comes to these kind of things we i will actually defer to the expertise of uh, you know our uh, our experts that which, which include the social work and mostly the med psych uh, uh, providers uh, who work with us it takes a whole village, doesn't it? Oh yes, it takes a whole village, and in a, what you know, the unpredictability of transplant and the number of personnel and the number of calls that happen just to make one transplant happen. So you guys have no idea. Hey Alex, I want to come back to you. Hopefully, uh, we've got your uh, connection back. Um, how does a how does a transplant recipient, or, or maybe a candidate for that matter, we talk about getting involved? Involved in the transplant community, Phil talked about what a great support network that he had and how important that was in combination with his fitness and his positive attitude. But if somebody says, hey, we, we want to get it, how do I get involved in the transplant community? What do you do? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think there are a lot more resources now than uh, when you and I went through this whole process. And, you know, I, I really feel like the um, now kind of taking an outsider lens, looking at the Chris Klug Foundation and all the resources you have in the community you're building is a great starting point. And there's there are multitudes of organizations out there. Some of them 
organ specific kidney transplant, heart transplant, liver transplant um, that have built communities and host events and have advocacy and opportunities to get involved. And, and it's really much more accessible now. And so I think th those can be good starting places. And, and, you know, I, I also kind of in building that community and, you know, you have, I think the community of your family and friends is also so important and kind of touching on uh, what I was asked earlier and, you know, Phil's experience and getting through this whole transplant process, especially as a young person, you know, I, I'm so, I feel, I think your case is just so impressive and just out of this world where I feel like I can barely run 2.6 miles and you're running 26, which that's more because of an effort issue on my part than the health one, but you're really inspiring me. But I, I think it's also, it can be very challenging going through the transplant process, sometimes how slow things are. You go through your transplant, you're like, I'm ready to live my life. I'm ready to go back and, you know, accomplish these amazing things or possibly even before the transplant. But I, I think the key to success often, in addition to your community, is really having a mindful approach. And to, it really, it's a little bit of a cliche, but it all sums it up very well as the serenity prayer, where you have the wisdom to know what you can't control, and then the courage and strength to control what you can. And often it can feel very frustrating because you're you're like, oh, I take these pills, but I'm not getting better fast enough, or there's something I want to accomplish that I'm not going to get there. And it's really important to just find that that piece and know, well, these are things I can control and I'm going to be very, very um, kind of good about following all those rules and recommendations. And then I'm going to just be at peace because this is this process will kind of get better in the rate that it will for me. And I like Phil's earlier comment where it's finding the next step. Really, I think after transplant, your eyes instantly go to the horizon. You say, what's the rest of my life going to look like? I have this new opportunity. But often in that early period, it's not uncommon to sometimes have some bumps. And I know for me, it took a few months to get back to, to kind of regular life. And so it's really important to kind of look straight down at your feet and just take that one step at a time. And then before you know it, you're running. Before you know it, maybe you're running a marathon. Um, but I think it's a really helpful way to, to kind of deal with the unknowns and anxiety. Yeah, I, that's, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I, I think there's definitely certain, something to the word intention. I think you need to live um, with intention. And by intention, I don't mean looking at that horizon. I think you need to look at every single day and the things that you do and just really approach it with a level of gratitude that will really get you through that day. Because honestly, we, Alex, Chris, myself, we've, Technically, we, we very well could not be here today having this conversation, right? Because if it weren't for the gift of life that was given to each of us, you know, we would not be able to, you know, move our own personal missions forward. So you need to really take a moment every morning to just stop and just have a moment of gratitude and then let that be your launching point for your day. And it's it, it's really worked out well for me. It's, it's gotten me through some very difficult days and when just something as simple as dealing with the uh the challenges of my daily medication i just have to step and think hey i get to still do this right so yeah so thanks thanks for that reminder alex i appreciate that i love that phil well, i start uh, every day with gratitudes and, well, well, one uh, of the other sorry. things that i sorry please doc go ahead no i just want to kind of you know you know kind of a you know related tone um i think the at least heal of uh you know, transplantation, whether it be kidney, liver, uh, heart, lungs, whatever it is, it, it, it is the organ shortage. Um, and, you know, and not many people who uh, who need a liver transplant or a kidney transplant have the ability to get an organ from a living donor, because that is the best case scenario, because you, you kind of, you know, kind of set aside a lot of anxiety associated with the whole process when you can have a planned procedure rather than waiting for that call which may come this week, next week, next year, who knows, right? And you, in the meantime, you're just kind of withering away because you're losing your muscle mass. You're like, you know, spending your days on dialysis. 
So I, I think the uh, awareness for living donation uh, needs to be more. And, uh, you know, and I, I, what I would encourage any person who requires a living, you know, a, a transplant is to, is to, is to, is to be, have that ability to reach out, to ask. And, and it, is, it is a very sensitive matter. Hey, can I walk up to you and say, hey, can I have your kidney, please? I mean, it, it is very hard to do. And so you, you ought to have a patient advocate, i.e. Uh, advocate for you who can ask for you. And you know what? I mean, the, you know, the, the, the social media is so powerful nowadays. I mean, and you have to utilize that. You know, you have to spread the word that, you know, this is what you need. This is what will get you through. You know, these are the, these are the options that I have. And if I have this gift of life from, you know, an altruistic donation in the United States, it's, it's going up. I mean, meaning uh, rather strangers are coming to our hospitals to become donors, not just for liver, kidneys, also for livers. And, uh, and, 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 and the, the word needs to get out that you need help. I mean, it is, you know, sometimes you need to ask for help because, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you are withering away every day. Uh, and I, I would encourage, you know, I mean, there are people who have come to us with donors because they had this sticker on the back of the car or they put up, you know, signpost in their backyard saying that I need a kidney. So speak out, let it be known that you need help and you will never know where the help comes from and use the social media. I mean, it is very, very powerful. And if you need the bumper stickers, let uh, CCNN and I know. We're uh, proud to share the Live Life, Give Life CKF message. So thanks, Doc. I only have one job as a MC, and that is to uh, make sure you guys get back to work and back to running on time. Um, if you didn't get your questions answered uh, in the chat, please uh, email us at uh, info at chrisklugfoundation.org or just go to chrisklugfoundation.org. You can email us from there. Um, Phil, I hope we'll see you uh, this uh, maybe next summer at Leadville. We're getting ready uh, with Chris Klug Foundation for our Leadville uh, mountain bike event with uh, 10 team members. On August 13th, we have the uh, run the following weekend with five team members. I think we still have one spot left for that. So Phil, we'll save you one for next year. And uh, I, I really, you know, I, I love all of these selfish athletic things that I get to do, but uh, this is my life's mission. There's nothing more uh, rewarding than, than having a conversation and, and being able to stay involved with the transplant community and, and help uh, give back in some way, hopefully helping those that are going through the same thing that Alex, you and, uh, and Phil and I did and that um, doc, you get to be a part of every single day. So thanks everyone for joining us. I, I would like to just give uh, each of you one last chance uh, for any uh, final comments um, Alex, why don't I, I start with you? If there's anything I didn't touch on, if you want to uh, add or, uh, or or highlight, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I think um, I think the only message I'd have to everyone out there is you can do this, whether it's you or your your loved one, or family member, or friend, and it won't always be easy, but you'll be amazed what you're capable of. So hang in there. Thanks, Alex. Phil, you got any uh, anything you want to share to? As we wrap up, um, yeah. Uh, one, I've already informed my coach that Leadville is on the calendar, so he's building out a training plan for the next uh, <laughs> thirteen months. Uh, so I'll see you, Leadville, twenty twenty three. Um, He'll have all of uh, Aspen and all of Team CKF there cheering you on, even if I got to run with you. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'd love to march to that finish line with you, uh, arm in arm. So, um, I guess my message would really be kind of like what I said earlier: is just you know, live for the next day. Um, I, it, you know, for the uh, for the viewers here, I'm assuming that you have a uh, transplant, you know, in your life, uh, whether it's yourself or through a loved one. Um, my message would definitely be, you know, just. Do what you need to do to get to the next day because that next day is going to be the day for your transplant. So keep it simple, just like that. Thank you, Phil. Doc, any closing comments? Uh, no, I think uh, there was a question on the Q and A. Uh, what questions should I ask the doctor going through a liver transplant? I think you know I kind of um, answered this question at the beginning of the talk. I think the first things to know is to identify the transplant center that can provide you with the best service, i.e. Good transplant rates, good successful outcomes, 
and then you know being able to follow up with them you know post transplant i think you know th- those are the things and then laparoscopic uh, living donor surgery that's another question that came up yeah there are certain centers that do um, offer uh, living donor uh, liver transplantation donation surgery laparoscopically but not all centers do Dr. Deepak uh, Vikraman, Alex Kula, and Phil Shin, thank you for taking an hour out of your day to put up with my uh, questions and emceeing and, and help, uh, help us uh, help others that are, as we said, going through the same thing that, that three of us, the three of us uh, did over the past years and, and uh, Doc, that you're involved with every day. I really appreciate uh, all that you guys do and, and for being champions. Uh, within the transplant community. I look forward to continuing this conversation and uh, hopefully Doc and uh, Alex and Phil will get you out to Aspen for Summit for Life or Leadville or or whatever it is. We'd love to uh, host you and continue this conversation. Best of luck to all of you guys. Live life, give life. Thank you so much.